thank you for checking out our YouTube channel and don't forget to subscribe and like. And please visit us at barrykibrick.com where you'll see all the ways that you can become a patron of our mission and help us continue to build a community of seekers who quest for knowledge, information, and most importantly, wisdom. Today on Between the Lines, a voice that is witty, disarming, and totally candid, the talented writer and performer, Sandra Tsinglo. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Sandra is known nationwide for her radio series, The Lowdown on Science. In her spoken word performances to sold out crowds, she delights audiences with her wry sense of humor and her truth-filled tales. Now with her book, The Mad Woman in the Volvo, she gives us a laugh out loud story of dealing with menopause, motherhood, and the men in her life. And although very personal and revealing, both men and women will benefit from her learned awareness. But I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old, and it was... You do, need, uh, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involved a lot of corruption. You don't get a chance to really talk about what's real, and that is the first thing to do. Sandra, welcome back to Between the Lines. It's been a number of years, but I am so glad you could make it. Thank you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, it's my pleasure. And I want to begin, the subheading is My Year of Raging Hormones. And there's no doubt that menopause is the main theme through the book, and the raging hormones has the main effect through the book. But it is one of the least things that you have to deal with through the book. This book, as I told you in the green room, I said, do you need a bodyguard after writing something <laughs> like this? It is so, I, it's so honest and so funny at the same time. I just, and you, you don't mention certain names, but everyone who, they know who they are. Yeah. How do you get away with that? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think this book really came out of a really transformative period in my own writing where I had just come off my last book before this was Mother on Fire, where it was about trying to get my uh, kindergarten, my five-year-old into a kindergarten in Los Angeles. And so it was a very worthy journey of first going, no one sends their kid to LA public school and trying to get her into private school and then having this epiphany that public schools for all kids and they should go. So it was kind of a really noble journey of a middle-aged neurotic woman like re-embracing public education. And then, of course, in the middle of my life, about age 46, as is in the book that you're sort of subtly referring to, I went to Burning Man with a couple of women friends to go experience the art, Barry, that was the point, and ended up having an affair, an extramarital affair with my you know, business partner of 10 years and best friend. So just kind of really slipped and it had never occurred to me to do this. It was after 20 years and one relation. It was, it was a real midlife crisis, except from a woman's point of view. So everything blew up in the most messy and awful way. But I realized, I, you know, in writing about it, it was kind of like my whole persona had to change in terms of the kind of memoirist I was. And you just got to keep writing through it, you know, right? There's no, way home but through Baghdad. So I had to start writing really honestly about some pretty terrible things oh. that I had done. We're going right? to we're going to share that because I think people people really can empathize with because everyone feels whether they have done terrible things or not they right. always feel like they have so right. they can empathize right. with that. And it kind of makes everyone feel a little better knowing they're not alone going through the same kind of stuff so to speak that you went through during this time. Yeah, and I think that one of the subplots in here, the sub themes is marriage, just like modern marriage. I think that I found after writing this tale, there's a lot of, you know, uh, you know, after feminism, now we're all post feminist, you know, we have this idea, many of us educated middle class couples that we're going to have this beautiful co parenting, co partnering, kind of it's a dance as you unload the dishwasher together, <laughs> and kind of like hand make the pasta, and then tutor your gifted children after school. School. So these marriages are just kind of housings for the organic pasta and the 
gifted and talented children, all that. But then people can really be, you know, it's kind of like those two laptops that flip open in the bed and not like or somebody's playing online boggle, somebody's like, that. The, I think some of these marriages can be really quite lonely within. And we, we hold up, we, we try to put a good face on, on them, but, but it can be really challenging. Well, it happens even after you remarry. Yes. You know, Mr. X, we yes. say, is, is first husband. Mr. Yeah. Y is second husband. Yes. But I saw the reason why you were having this trouble. And you, I don't know if you connected it with the reason, but I did at least. It is what you wrote, though, and that is your life is driven by passions. And you say, I don't even know if that's good, you write, you say, yeah. but it's driven by even the smallest passions and the largest passions. So if your mate cannot stay with that driven passion right. that you have, right. you could see how that would be one of the key reasons why a relationship could not be in harmony. Well, you know, I, I don't know. I have a kind of a, a sort of version of kind of like you can be driven by passions and your soulmate. And I also talk about, you know, that women need to have like three or four different husbands. You know, Mr. X is the provider, father of the kids. Mr. Y is the guy who talks to you at the end of the day. You know, Mr. Z is, you know, fixes things around the house or get, grabs the baseball bat at night. You know, kind of like the godfather type guy. And, and the fourth guy is just the intern so that you pay. So and I think that's how often like in marriages we treat ourselves like like kind of like, I thought you were going to go and get the United Arab miles or whatever. You, we treat each other like interns. But I think that it can be it can be pretty imbalanced, though, if uh, the relationship, not out of balance, if people are passionate and talking about their passions all the time, it can be hard to run a household. You know, so there's something to be said for emotionally um, being emotionally shut down because a, a marriage will work better that way if you don't, if you emotionally repress your emotions. Well, especially because the world's in, in, in both cases, they're un, as you say, these are, they're unfamiliar to each other. So right. you're unfamiliar in a sense with Mr. X. You think you'd be more familiar with Mr. Y because he's your business partner, right. but then you realize he's not offering you all the things that Mr. X. So you're living, like you said, with those two laptops open right. in sort of separate worlds. Right, and I, I think the kind of the little telling metaphor image that I had is, an, and my and Mr. X, my, my ex-husband was a musician and is a musician goes on the road a lot. Thank God. He's very, he's very successful and talented. So we would come home after six or seven weeks on the road, put his bags down on the front porch. And the first thing he would say is like, the roof needs retiling. And I would always tell that as the Ur story because he didn't say, honey, how are you? What have you been thinking? He goes, the roof needs retiling. And I, it was kind of a story that I, my mantra of like why I needed to get out of that marriage. But then I'm with the guy who says, oh, honey, how, blah, 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 and the roof needs retiling, right? <laughs> like, like, it's kind of like, so I'm becoming like my ex-husband. Oh. Like, it's kind of like that we balance in partnerships. Like me and my ex-husband, he was like more neat. He has amazing ways of stacking Tupperware of a geometry that you can't even imagine. And so he would kind of like, when I would like try to cut a tomato, he would rush across the room telling me I'm cutting it wrong. I'd say, I I'm 42 years old. I think I know how to cut a tomato. But now that I'm with this next person, you balance each other out. Now I'm calling, the, I'm retiling the roof and work about the sewage and like it's really I mean it's part of life's journey well you know part of life's journey though that throws you a curve was you really didn't realize the suffering that you or your family would go through when this decision to leave husband X and move to husband Y would take place it almost like it almost seems like it hits you upside the head even though you'd think Oh boy, this is going to be a lot of problems. But you seem to have gotten at least caught off guard in the book. Let me leave it at that. Yeah, and I think now I don't know how many extramarital affairs you've had, Barry. In I your can life. tell you now, my wife is in the booth. <laughs> Absolutely none. It would never <laughs> enter my mind, nor will it ever. Good. Go ahead. And hopefully, viewers won't either, because it's it's really a, you know it's it's not it, it, it's like people falling you know spiraling and claims from a plane. I think, so and I described it in the book, that when you, let's say, and, and again, I, my partner, and we had been business partners for 10 years. We traveled a lot. We were friends. Both our spouses traveled a lot. And to a certain extent, they didn't even may, maybe enjoy socializing with us. So we would be each other's sort of social escort for about 10 years and hang out totally platonically. And so, but, and you can start having a myth about your marriage, uh, and, which is, maybe half myth and half not, that we're co-parents and co-partners. So, and it seems, you know, when my partner comes home, he would w rather watch 
Comedy Central than talk to me. Or if my, my wife comes home, she prefers to you know, knit or do something rather than talk to me. So we kind of were saying, so it'll be great when we leave because they seem annoyed with us, irritated with us. And so if, if we leave, the bed will be bigger, they'll have more room, and it's kind of like, and they'll be relieved, and they'll say, thank God, I've wanted to divorce you for years, you've made it so easy. There's something, you know, that, that and now I will say, like, and, and like, that to a certain extent, some of this is a little true, that when people of partners, you know, being split up, they actually sometimes do prefer being like alone and on their own. But at the time, it's so emotional. I think it's not our changing notions of what family is. There still is a family uh, romance and nostalgia and feeling and not wanting to fail that divorce is really a sad thing. And it is, and, and yes, we didn't anticipate the explosion. And then the other explosion you didn't anticipate was the menopause and yes. the rage that yes. would occur. In fact, at first, you don't even know what's going on with yourself. Yes. And finally, your friend tells you, it's menopause. At first, you're relieved. Oh, yeah. I thought I was having a tumor. I don't remember what it was exactly, but I remember you being at first right. very relieved. Right. And then you realize that now this rage is going on. And besides, it's going on with you in menopause. Right. Your daughters are going through their hormonal change. Oh, yeah. So you've got three women in a now divided house going back and forth all of them in some form of emotional discontent. Yes. To put it mildly. Yes. <laughs> yes. And that can be, uh, although, although that does sound like a bit of a, you know, a whitewater <laughs> rafting ride, in a way, though, it has allowed us to, to sort of connect in a way that, I mean, if I was totally normal and together and watching my kids blow up, I, I, I don't know that I would have the compassion that I would oh. since I have this other play. So I understand what it is like to feel this way. So I think that in a way it's, it's let us really communicate and go to the heart of things. And I think with divorce that they do go back and forth. It, in a way, it's, I mean, they sometimes say children choose their parents. I, I think it's had an escape valve of, of tension that has made it maybe better. Now, through the book, there's another little theme that I couldn't help. Uh, by the way, I, I want to, men can relate to this. At least I was able to relate to this book. Well, first of all, as I say, I've been through menopause twice, <laughs> once with my wife and once with my mother. So I'm an experienced person right. with menopause. But besides that, it's relatable because men play such a large role in the book. They will see themselves in this as well. But, and one of the things that I, <laughs> personally do deal with a little bit. And it's very funny. And it's what you say, though. I think one of your women friends tell you, you know, if you go to see your doctor, he can prescribe you certain hormones, certain things right. that'll help get you through this period. But you can't face being weighed. You don't have the weight. Okay. Wait for you in this thing. And I told that to my, my wife. And she goes, that sounds like you. And I go, well, you're right. I, I can't either. So, uh, but you know, so you're almost avoiding, you are, you're at least, you're right. avoiding going to the doctor just because you won't get weighed. Right. And at this point in your life, especially through menopause, oh, as yeah. you said, you could gain weight by air. Yeah. Through just <laughs> inhaling too much, you right. know. Right, right. Yes, absolutely. And I, you know, I just did a show over the summer at the Broad stage in July and, and it was called The Bitches Back. And it was a version of some of the stuff in, in this book. Um, and it, as opposed to a stage play that I'm doing that's also based on the book. But there was this theme about being weighed over and over again. And I looked at the play, uh, at the monologue, I looked at the text and go, this weighing joke is in here way too many times. But it turns out it, the audience, like, it is something that we really think about in middle age, a oh. lot of stepping on that clank, the, why are they the detecto scales? Just that word and the clanking sound of the weights and they, and they weigh you and then immediately take your blood pressure and go, oh, it seems kind of hot. There's another man in your life. Yes. He's your father. Yes. And we'll talk about the second thing that happens. But first, your father, also in his 80s. Well, at, he's 94 at, 94 now. now. Okay. Oh, so Ooh. he was maybe, I don't know how old he was at this time. Yeah. But he gets arrested. Yes. And he's a character that is juggling bank books and names and everything. The fact that he's not been, in fact, I'm... Has the IRS gone after him after you've written this? Because as I, I mean, they read this, they're going to have to investigate him. There's no doubt about it. It's amazing what this guy does. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, they could go after him now. Yeah, but, but it's true. He, um, 
he's a sort of a mathematical genius and you know who always you know his briefcase is in a frosted flakes box and i think that he he will have like checks that are like gmac right some fund which doesn't even have that name anymore it's ally so old yellow blank checks but they're in the names are q i x i turns out their names of uh, chi- like mother, like like mothers in law of like old wives like, that are dead, of dead people in China are the signers on the stretch. But he's like signs, so, and and he gave me a check of like a huge amount to help me buy a ha- like a house that I borrowed from him. And I go, this check, this won't work. And he goes, uh, try it, you know, because no, there's no electronic interface. It's kind of like it is like a paper. It's like having money in your bed. It's it's amazing, but his schemes work. He's very hard to hack because he doesn't use a computer. <laughs> He says these, you know, the checkbook that no one knows about. It's really crazy. And he used to um, sort of um, invest things in my name. So I would suddenly get a tax bill. I go, for $3,000, what's this? Because he was just forging my signature for years and years. So it's amazing. You know, uh, at the same time, so, okay, two divorces, menopause, father (laughs) arrested. And you figure out, though, you're you're obviously you you call this you're in a life loop. That's yes. the term yeah. you use. You're yeah. you know you're you're yeah. going through this crisis and it's spiraling downward. Yeah. And you are now determined though. I'm going to make a happiness project. <laughs> and and well, I'll leave it at that. That's for, you know enough said. <laughs> well, I think and, and there's that, that book that Gretchen Rubin's The Happiness Project is big. Um, best-selling book. I, I, I think that, you know, I, I try to get sort of in this book of some real, I, I felt a year of re- real depression and despair, which is not always fun fun to write about or fun to read. But I think that women can have a certain middle age a malaise in the middle that you can't tag to any one thing. Like, uh, work is okay, family's okay. Sort of this, this malaise where we are thinking, you know, we're wishing for more joy in our lives. Now, although it turns out when they do analyze happiness across the globe, um, Dan Buettner, who did the Blue Zones, this project, turns out people cite um, among their less happy things as childcare, traffic, and housekeeping which is, of course, much of the <laughs> fabric of a working woman's life. You're driving in traffic. It's like childcare. So that we're doing sort of repetitive activities don't, that don't inspire joy. But there is this notion that, you know, to get joy in the middle of your life, you should kind of learn to sing or organize your sock drawer that's really tidying up now. The magic of tidying up, it will liberate all this joy. But I'm noticing they're always like, I, I call them like, you know, uh, projects for a Finnish work study camp for otherly able children because they're always like and arrange some pretty flowers instead of like you know get drunk and have an affair and go on facebook and flame people doing things that are truly fun see that's the difference so but it, it's always this g-rated and you'll feel better with a walk and just a dog and have a run on the beach or you yeah, are my favorite but like Frickin' farmer's market, who cares? <laughs> Produce, you know, there's no glass of wine, there's no, you know, porn or anything fun. You know, not that porn. Anyway, I'm going <laughs> off track here, but, but you know, farmer's markets are supposed to be fun. They're really not. So I think at the end of that journey of the happiness projects, it's learning what really is fun as opposed to what people tell you is fun. Well, one thing that you make a clear observation of, and I've had this discussion, when we are young, it's always men being blamed for the locker room talk. You say here, though, if male authors wrote half the things about their wives that female authors wrote about, their husbands would be run out of town. And all men that I know, we never talk intimately about our relationships on any level. Yeah, no, I, and I think that's really true. I think it really is a double standard. And I certainly, when I went on tour with this book, I was like doing some, you know, uh, public radio shows midday where I would get, they would just, you know, introduce me as a person who went to Burning Man and had an affair and blew up her life. And men would call in and say, you know, if I did the same thing, yeah, I'd be run out of town. I wouldn't be on an author book tour. So, so in a way, it's like women are having these midlife crises the way that men do. But I, but I think it is true. And I think the scene that you're referring to is, is kind of interesting. And, and my friend who actually said that was doing it in a response to a New York Times Sunday magazine piece that went on and on about a woman whose husband cooks, but he makes it such an expensive and time consuming project that messes up the kitchen. And it, it's like, she was complaining about that he cooks in a very disorderly way. And my friend was saying, oh, please, if I wrote that about my wife, you know, for instance, he, he says, you know, it, you know, a woman can have a baby, gain 50 pounds, never lose it. 
husband can't say anything for the next 30 or 40 years. <laughs> like, oh, that's a pretty good point. It's kind of like, so it's like, it's it's like, you know, it, it, yeah, it's kind of a different contract. It's kind of like, uh, well, uh, here I am. If, if this is what you have now. You married me there. And and men can't talk about it. And I think there's probably something to be said said for that of like truer conversations across the board. Well, I think in, in general, that's what you say. If, if more people were able to express their right. emotions, that's right. part of this. Part of this book, in fact, yeah. is to encourage that. Yes, yes, and encourage men to speak out out too. And the, I think that even taking the notion of the whole midlife quote unquote crisis, and it used to be the narrative that, you know, okay, the man turns 45, he gets the red sports car and the toupee and, and Kate's his 20 years younger secretary, and then the wife is the victim. But, you know, now that I've lived through it and seen both sides and heard a lot about people's stories about it, you know, I think anybody, 45 man or woman, if your spouse, and we're in a new age around marriage, it's economically different than it was before. But yeah, if your partner, like some of the wives, you have spent the last 15 years in bed knitting and having three cats and actually doesn't want to have, if I can say, sex anymore, and which I've also heard that too, of kind of like, well, my wife didn't want to have sex with me for 10 years. So what am I supposed to do? Resign myself to this? I go, well, if you're a man, that's true. I'm, I'm sympathetic to men or women who are trying to look forward to the second half of their lives and look at their loved ones, look at the people they love, but their own tracks and really reevaluate and try to make a choice towards joy again. Well, there's also, besides humor, besides all the insights, there is wisdom I wanna share with people that you write in this book. And this is one that I think so many people could benefit by. Dealing with the grief that we've been carrying for decades is the way to physical and emotional health. And I am firmly, I firmly believe that we oftentimes don't even know the grief that we're dealing with. So it makes it doubly hard, but you have to deal with it. Yes. You have to. Yeah, and I think it was said to me that, you know, you can get to the age of 50 by carrying that grief, but if you keep carrying it after 50, stuff will start to, your body will start to break down. And I think that in my case, it's my grief over my mother dying fairly early at Alzheimer's. And I was at an age, I was about 22 when she was really diagnosed, where I couldn't deal with it at all didn't go, she was, you know, in my town in a convalescent home. I didn't go visit her for four years, not even once. You know, I, I did initially, but then it was like too hard for me, you know, at that particular time. And I've learned, uh, you know, to be a very good visitor of hospitals in subsequent in subsequent years, but it's it's completely true in that sometimes in our relationships, you know, we're managing, you know, uh, we're, uh, you know there's a book cited in, oops, I married my mother, um, or like, oops, I married my father, you know, that sort of thing where we're kind of like, kind of taking the ghost of our uh, parental relationship and putting it in our marriage. And how, how does that work? And, and I think that's part of dealing with that. And I think I had big separation anxiety with a new man that I was with. And it was because I almost had put him like, finally, there's somebody that loves me, not as much as my mother, but there's an island of love to swim, of love and acceptance to swim into. So hence, hence I sort of maybe kind of like mapped him onto my mom because he was just that kind of guy. But through this whole thing, you are learning. You yeah. are gaining wisdom. And one of the, the key things you realize is to stop judging yourself and to lower the bar. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the term you specifically right. use. Right. To don't judge yourself right. and lower that bar. And I don't believe that lowering the bar means not doing the best that you can. It means just that, in fact. It means right. doing the best that you can, but not some expected best that's supposedly out there. And believe it or not, when you do the best that you can, that is when the best is achieved. But don't judge yourself that hard. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And I think especially with 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 women in this particular time. And, and there's another thing I'm tracing under there, you know, almost 50 years after Betty Friedan's um, feminine mystique. It's it's like, you know, men were supposed to move in, in towards home to be more nurturing. Women would go into the workplace to humanize the workplace. But in fact, just feminism, that's a, I know this is academic, but it's really become capitalized that now instead of one person working, we have two people and the only, you know, the only people of one is the makers of appliances. So you see household appliances have gone up, everyone's frenetically working, trying to be wives, trying to be super parents, you know, with their mo moms, you know, the average 
full-time working mother today spends more hours per week with her kids than average 1950s stay-at-home mom. So there's really a lot of stories like ha many hamsters on wheels are going like this. And then you have to get weighed at the end of the day, <laughs> which is the worst. You know, a few kettle chips, you know, just healed some of the pain. So I think that you, if we kind of like lower the bar and say what we're really doing, you know, an example, I'll tell you this horrible example. I don't know if it's in there. Usually stuff is where one time we were, I went to Target with my girl and so they came out of the bathroom and started walking out the door and there's a line of moms looking at them and then when they came out I said can't you at least pretend you wash your hands when all those moms are like <laughs> like, like, like uh, I don't know if they've ever washed their hands after oh. going to the bathroom I'm sorry you know they seem to survive some bacteria is good for you you know just kind of like lowering the bar of what we actually really did so I think it's very appealing Sandra, I could talk to you forever. Our time is up. I'm going to end with these last few words. I'm just delighted to be giving birth to a new self, and we're delighted you shared that birth with us today. Isn't that lovely? Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And thank you. I said Sandra. I said I would say Sandra. Yeah, I both Thank you, it. Sandra. And now, <laughs> before Sandra leaves, I'd like to leave you with these words from the mad woman in the Volvo. Now is the time to deal with all those old emotional memories, habits that have literally shaped your neural circuits. Fortunately, we can actually change our thoughts and emotional reflexes. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between all those old memories and habits, there does exist a new self. Seek it out and do so without shame. Thank you, Sandra. Oh, my pleasure.